Hi, and welcome to part six in our series of micro lessons on the countercurrent multiplier. In part five, we left off with the question How is the water that is reabsorbed along the descending thin limb returned to the vasculature? Well, first off, we know that capillaries are involved in the movement of water and solutes between the vasculature and interstitium. So, with that in mind, let's review the relevant capillary networks within the kidney. And they are the glomerular capillary network, the peritubular capillaries, and the capillaries that make up the vasa recta. Now, the glomerular capillary network begins as the afferent arterial enters the glomerulus and ends as the efferent arterial exits the glomerulus. The primary function of the glomerular capillaries is to filter the blood and form the ultrafiltrate. They are able to do this mostly because the glomerular capillaries are fenestrated, which favors the formation of the ultrafiltrate and also because they are situated between the afferent and efferent arterioles, which regulate blood flow within the glomerular capillaries and thus they regulate the formation of the ultrafiltrate. Now, as the efferent arteriole exits the glomerulus, it promptly merges into the peritubular capillaries, which make up a dense, convoluted network of capillaries that surround the proximal convoluted tubule, cortical thick ascending limb, distal convoluted tubule, and cortical collecting duct. Notice how the peritubular capillaries are restricted to the cortex, and because of their location and proximity to the nephron segments within the cortex, they are responsible for returning the water and solutes to the vasculature that are reabsorbed along these nephron segments. Now, interestingly, the endothelial cells that make up the peritubular capillaries are often damaged or lost in patients with chronic kidney disease and antibody-mediated rejection of renal transplants. Now, segments of the peritubular capillaries will branch and enter the medulla, and as they do, they form the capillaries that make up the vasa recta. Notice how the vasa recta enters the medulla and descends towards the base. This segment is referred to as the descending vasa recta, which is abbreviated DVR. Now the DVR then makes a 180 degree turn and ascends up through the medulla until it reaches the cortex. This segment is referred to as the ascending vasa recta and it is abbreviated AVR. Now as the AVR leaves the medulla and enters the cortex, it merges back into the peritubular capillaries. We should point out that the capillaries that make up the vasa recta are sparse relative to the peritubular capillaries, which are rather abundant. This is consistent with the fact that the medulla receives only 10% of total renal blood flow. This means that the oxygen tension within the medulla will be about 60% of that seen in the cortex. And because oxygen is shunted from the descending vasa recta to the ascending vasa recta, the oxygen tension of the inner medulla will be even lower. These differences in oxygen tension mean that sodium chloride transport along the thick ascending limb is susceptible to changes in oxygen tension, since the oxygen-dependent activity of the sodium-potassium ATPase is required to drive the NKCC2-dependent reabsorption of sodium chloride from the ultrafiltrate along the thick ascending limb. Now, with these structural similarities and differences in mind, in Part 7 of this series, will explain how the vasa recta reabsorbs water from the medullary interstitium. But first, answer these multiple choice questions to help reinforce what you just learned. Good luck, and I'll see you shortly.